Well, amen. That is a full house down there, right? Thank you, Greenwoods, for uh, bringing us today's children's moment. Uh, let me again just say good morning and welcome. It's great uh, to be back with you. I uh, appreciate so much, uh, Chris and Willie, filling in the past couple weeks. And I uh, just wanted to share that during my sabbatical time these past two weeks, uh, one of the things that I've mentioned to you that I, I like to do, uh, one of the ways that I connect with God is I, I go and, and ride my bike uh, out, you know, find a mountain back trail and I just go and ride. And so uh, I did that and some of you may connect with that. You may connect with God through nature or being outdoors. Uh, some of you maybe not. Uh, but uh, I, I decided to go over toward the Aniston area and there's a, a bike trail called the Cold Water Mountain Bike Trail out there. So I went out there and I was uh, looking at the, the different difficulties of trails that were available. Uh, so you'll see on the screen, uh, there's these different trail difficulties. You've got green is the easiest. You've got blue, which is a little more difficult. You've got black, which is very difficult. And then you've got double black, which is extremely difficult. So guess which bike trail I chose. I appreciate that vote of confidence, but no, I chose green uh, because remember I said I wanted to connect with God, uh, not meet Him. So I chose green, and, and I was going uh, down the, the trail, and there was, there was these three different trails, uh, and I'm not making this up. It's called Baby Bear Trail, Mama Bear Trail, and Papa Bear Trail. And so I'm going down Baby Bear, and I'm riding the bike, and things are, are pretty smooth, and, and it's fun, and I'm not having to do much work. I'm just kind of letting the bike do the work. And, and then all of a sudden, I transition from baby bear trail to mama bear trail. And how many people would guess that mama bear is a little more difficult? You know, so I'm going down mama bear trail. And then all of a sudden, the laws of physics kick in. Uh, because what uh, goes up must come down. But in this case, what goes down must come up. And for you experienced riders out there, I'm sure you're able to just power through on up a hill. Not me. Uh, I had to get off of the bike and walk the bike up uh, a, a pretty steep hill. And for a, quite a while, I was just walking right beside my bike, pulling it up. Finally got to Papa Bear Trail. And uh, how many of you know that if you can survive Mama Bear, then you can I typically survive Papa Bear that works in more ways than one. And so I uh, got on Papa Bear Trail and had some walking, but not as much. And as I got to the end of all that, I sat down and I was resting and just reflecting on the metaphor of the life that we find ourselves in right now. And I thought, man, what I just experienced is like this, this parable of just how life has been going for the past several months. You know, most of us earlier this year, uh, things were rocking along. We started out 2020, things were rocking along, and then all of a sudden we, we get hit by this uncharted territory of, okay, well, what's next, and, and when's it going to end, and what, what's happening, and we, we just see all these things, all these uphill battles that are coming. Uh, some of you right now may still be in an uphill battle, something that's going on in your life. I'm talking with some folks earlier who've experienced loss of loved ones. I'm talking with folks who are uh, experiencing financial difficulties. I've talked with folks who are experiencing uh, just challenges in relationships. And you might be going through some of those even right now as we speak. Uh, uncertainty has been present and it continues to loom in our lives. Uh, divisions and tensions uh, seem higher than normal right now. And there's a lot of negativity out there. I mean, some folks are, are more negative than a, a Nick Saban COVID test, right? I mean, there's a lot of negativity out there, right, in the world today. They're, they're, they're just anywhere you look, anywhere you go, man, you just, you don't have to look far. There it is. So we've been exploring this series of the five discourses of Jesus in Matthew's gospel if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to be opening to Matthew chapter 13, the series that we've called Manifesto. We're kind of jumping back onto that series today after taking a couple weeks of a break. And today we get to the third of the five discourses. 
in Matthew chapter 13. So if you'll be turning there, uh, today I want to equip us by examining the politics of the kingdom. Now, I'm aware that by the very mention of that word, politics, that hairs on the backs of necks begin standing up, either in this room or online. As a matter of fact, one of the comments that I, I get from time to time is, uh, Brett, we really appreciate you not bringing politics into the pulpit. And, and when we say politics, uh, we tend to have a very uh, westernized view of that word and just what it even means. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware or if you've heard lately, uh, but there's an election coming up. Uh, there's not been much said about it, but but there is one coming up, and, and so it, it's the, the elephant in the room, uh, and it's the donkey all at the same time. And so really and truly, uh, though, what we mean when we say, thanks for not bringing politics into the pulpit, what we really mean is thanks for not being partisan. Uh, because the classical definition of a politic is something that we have been discussing throughout this entire series in Matthew's Gospel. In his new book, uh, Scandalous Witness, Dr. Lee Camp, a professor from Lipscomb University, gives a classical definition of a politic. He says, by politic, I mean an all-encompassing manner of communal life that grapples with all the questions the classical art of politics is always asked. How do we live together? How do we deal with offenses? How do we deal with money? How do we deal with enemies and violence? How do we arrange marriage and families and social structures? How is authority mediated, employed, and ordered? Camp goes on to say, how do we rightfully order passions and appetites? Where is human history headed? And what does it mean to be human? And what does it look like to live in a rightly ordered human community that engenders flourishing and justice, the peace of God? So when I say I want us to examine the politics of the kingdom, I want you to know I'm not trying to be cute. I'm not trying to be radical for radical sake. I'm not even trying to be controversial or bring up our traditional understandings of politics into the pulpit, but you need to know this. My agenda is that if you claim to follow Jesus, if you claim to live the Jesus way, if you declare him as Lord, then there is a greater politic at stake. And if we're going to even come close to articulating this vision for a Christian life, we have to look at Jesus and his politic, the kingdom of God. And so that's what I aim to do the next few weeks. And here's my commitment to you. Uh, in the 10 years that I have been your preaching minister, I have not once ever told you who to vote for, and I don't intend to start now. Pretty sure most of you wouldn't listen to me anyway, but I don't intend to start that now. But I believe it would be irresponsible if I did not prayerfully equip this church to rightly divide the word of truth, as Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said it this way in 1874, almost 146 years ago. Wherein I have succeeded, I magnify the name of the Lord. Wherein I have failed, I lament my faultiness. And now once more we will try again. And may God the Holy Spirit, without whose power nothing can be done aright, help us rightly to divide the word truth. So my hope 
is to equip us as faithful witnesses of our Lord, not just in spite of the season that we find ourselves in, but in the midst of it. So Jesus comes to this third of five major discourses. So we've looked at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7. We've looked at the missional discourse of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10. And now we come to Matthew chapter 13. The discourse on the kingdom. And there's such a large crowd for this particular discourse that, that Jesus has to get in a boat and push off a little out of the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And when I was in Israel a few years ago, I took a picture or a video rather of the Sea of Galilee. And you'll see that scrolling on the screen. Cut that sound. Cut that sound off if you want to. <laughs> kind of loud. But, but what we see here is that, can you imagine Jesus just putting, putting himself in, in a boat, and, and going just a little bit off this shore in order to speak to the crowd. And in this culture, this was a culture where the teacher sat and the pupils stood. Our culture is reverse of that. Teacher stands and pupils usually sit. But Jesus was sitting, the people are standing, and, and here's what is said in Matthew chapter 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such a large crowd had gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, while it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Verse 10, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. And then Jesus goes on to quote from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, right after Isaiah says these words, here am I, send me. Right after that, Jesus quotes, and he says, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. The word of God for the people of God. So Jesus' sermon on the mount really compels this further talk that Jesus is going to, to talk about. And, and if you go back even one chapter, uh, in, in chapter 12, you'll see that, that Jesus says something right before chapter 13 launches. If you're in your Bible app or if you have your Bible, just go back and flip to chapter 12 and look at what he says at the end of chapter 12. What he says is he's trying to uh, help his disciples here. He says this, this back at the end of chapter, that those who do the will of the Father, that those who do his will are his brother and his sister and his mother. A scholar, Stanley Howarth, says it this way. He says, you do not become a brother or sister to Christ through birth, 
but you become his brother and sister by learning to be his disciple. So Jesus uses these parables in Matthew 13 to to help his disciples what? To help his disciples discern how the kingdom of heaven is established. And now he's used parables before, so this is not necessarily something new. I mean, he used the parable of the wise man who built his house on the rock back in Matthew 7. He's used the, the parable of the old wineskins and the new wineskins in Matthew chapter 9. And, and so when he gets to these parables in Matthew 13, it's not exactly something new, but he, he moves to talking about this, this seed time and this harvest and these images from God's created order, a picture of how God would act to redeem his people from their sins, to, to rescue them from exile, to deliver them from oppression. But the hearers weren't really expecting what Jesus would share. They weren't really expecting him to share failure. And what we see kind of mixed in these, this, this parable is, is this mixture of failure and success. This is what, what failure in the kingdom of God looks like. This is what success in, in the kingdom of God looks like. And it may not be what you think. And so what is Jesus saying? What's the point of the parable? Well, he tells the disciples in verse 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word of God and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life, the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth, they choke out the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Now, I know that's a lot of reading, but it's important for us to, to get the context and to understand kind of where Jesus is going, what, where he's coming from. This parable of the sower is to help these disciples, to help disciples and understand what they've been given. What have you been given as a disciple? And so you may have heard this passage preached. I don't know. Maybe you've heard it a hundred times. Or maybe this is your first time hearing these words of Jesus. And I'll tell you from a scholarly perspective, all that I scoured the past week this parable has been widely interpreted. <laughs> but for our remaining time, I want to move into some practical takeaways from this passage that I believe will help us during this season that we find ourselves in. Uh, on the screen, you'll see a picture of my passport, my primary source of identification when I travel. And I'm, I'm thankful for the privilege of having a passport and being able to travel. But church, I have to remind myself and I have to remind us this morning that my fundamental identity is in Christ, not my country. Now, here's where you need to hear me say what I'm not saying. What I'm not saying is that I don't love my country because I do. I'm not saying we need to remove ourselves from all things associated with the political process or voting. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that my allegiance is to Jesus Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit, who is 
a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory, as Paul tells us in Ephesians. Uh, in the movie, A Hidden Life, the true story is told of Franz Jägerstatter, an Austrian peasant who refused to fight for Nazi Germany during the Second World War. And having to choose between fighting or never seeing his wife and three daughters again, Franz, a, a Christian, is recorded by Thomas Merton as saying, I am convinced that it is still best that I speak the truth, even though it costs me my life. He was killed on August 9th, 1943, for refusing to declare allegiance to Hitler. The movie is actually, uh, the title of the movie is based off of words from George Eliot's Middlemarch. It says, for the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts and that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. Franz's story kind of went, went hidden for, for years. And so for a, a movie to be released of his life in 2019 is, is quite remarkable. But what if nothing would have ever been said of, of his stance, of, of his decision to follow rather than do what he felt was against his belief. So we started our time this morning singing the song, Fairest Lord Jesus. And I just want to ask us, can, can you imagine, just imagine with me, can you imagine a community that began to not just sing this song, but began to live it? Can you imagine a community who decided to live Thee will I cherish, thee will I honor, thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown, fairest Lord Jesus. First, let us be faithful to the words of Jesus. And that leads us to this next takeaway, and that is that, that faithful hearers and faithful listeners to God's word become fruitful servants of God's world. And so whoever has ears, let them hear, Jesus says. I appreciate uh, our connections minister, Chris Richardson, calling us to acknowledge our distractions last week and to listen and to realize that we are in this overly distracted world and place and how are we posturing ourselves to be able to listen, particularly to the Word of God? So I say it almost every week, but join us on Tuesday mornings here or online at 6 a.m. Because we want to help you practice listening. That's what we're doing. We're practicing listening to the Word of God. So is listening and understanding and, and practice, is that always easy? Absolutely not. I can be the first to attest to that. I struggle in my own life. I was driving up uh, 65, I, Interstate 65, just a few days ago, and I passed that big sign. Many of you have seen it. You probably know what I'm talking about. Go to church. Or the devil will get you. Anybody seen that sign coming up? 65. Um, and while I don't think I agree with that theology, I, I do believe that our gathering matters. And I do believe, as my friend John Mark Hicks says, in the sacrament of the assembly. And Jesus says, be careful. Be careful, the, the evil one snatches the uncovered word away. So are we covering the word 
in prayer and in meditation. Jesus says, be careful, even when you receive the word with joy. I wrote on my, my mirror this week, I choose joy. But even when we receive the word with joy, be careful because it's not how we start our history with the word. It's how we continue it. Be careful of being possessed by possessions. Jesus said the deceitfulness of wealth, it, it chokes out the word, making it unfruitful. So, how might we live a life by faith rather than a life of fear by failure? Church, that leads us to this third takeaway, and that is that the word of Jesus moves faithful hearers to care deeply for people in their communities, nations, and all over the world. And so I, I want you to take just a moment and reflect on this statement. The word of Jesus moves faithful hearers to care more deeply for people in their communities, nations, and all over the world. And I want us to take just 10 seconds of silence and ask God. I, I can't be your Holy Spirit. I, I can't. I want you to just ask God in 10 seconds of silence what that looks like for you this week. Let's take 10 seconds right now. And so, the word of Jesus, it moves faithful hearers to a greater politic. The elephant in the room and the donkey submit to the lamb. 1 Peter 1, 19 tells us, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. As we prepare for communion this morning, I want us to be reminded of these words. That is that the sense of hearing cannot be better employed than in hearing the word of God. The sounds of music are beautiful to the ear. News may fascinate the ear. But the truth of the gospel, the good news, inebriates the heart. I want to ask the shepherds of this church, if you will, uh, just please stand for a moment. Uh, you're welcome to make them aware of any uh, prayer needs that you have this morning on your way out. Uh, you may also, thank you shepherds, you may also make us aware of any needs that you have on that online connection card. And please, I'm um, so grateful for the prayer requests that come in through our online connection card. Uh, today's the day that you want to know more about Jesus or, or enter into a relationship with him or be baptized into him. We would, we would love to talk to you about that, celebrate that with you, and uh, would encourage you to see myself or one of the shepherds immediately following our service today. Uh, I want to also thank you for your uh, continued giving online, and I uh, want you to know that that is available in the foyer as you lead. We're going to pray, and then uh, you're going to have a moment just where you're sitting or at home uh, to participate in communion. So hopefully you grab those elements on your way in. Uh, and as we pray, let's reflect on this space in which we've been gifted and given. So, Father in heaven, uh, hallowed be your name. Uh, your kingdom come and your will be done 
on this earth as it is in heaven. God, we thank you for the word that was not only written, but became flesh and dwelt among us. God, we thank you that you have given us the example of, of the life and teachings, and yes, even the, the politics of Jesus. And Father, may we continue to fix our eyes on him, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And through him, we believe in you, the one who raised him from the dead. And so we come to this time where we eat the bread and drink the cup and we remember, yes, what Jesus did, but we, we celebrate during this meal that we serve a risen Savior, a Savior who defeated death, a Savior that has given us the hope and the promise of being with you for all time. So as we eat the bread and drink the cup, may we remember that we are doing so among a body of believers. May we remember that we are doing so based on our identity that is founded and being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb, your Son, Jesus. So we give you this time. We pray, come Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and kindle them in the fire of your love. It's in Jesus we pray.